Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the NAGT webinar. The NAGT webinar series is your one-stop shop for strengthening work in earth education. Webinars in the series feature novel and innovative work in earth education research and pedagogy, uh, new teaching materials, and the classroom and professional experiences of people like you. The NAGT webinar series is free and open to the public, and we encourage you to invite your colleagues to attend and join the discussion. On the screen and linked in the chat is a link to the webinar series where you can find the webinar schedule, an archive of past events, and information on our sponsoring projects and programs. You can find slides, resources, and recordings of each webinar, including today's, through the webinar archives. Before we get started, please take a moment to review the Zoom controls on the screen. We ask that you leave your microphones muted and cameras off. Live captions are available for this presentation. To turn on captions, click the live transcript button at the bottom control bar and select show subtitle from the pop-up menu. If you have questions and comments along the way, we encourage you to enter those into the chat box. Webinar presenters and staff will be monitoring the chat throughout the presentation. A reminder that participants in all NAGT meetings and events are expected to abide by the NAGT code of conduct, which applies in all venues, events, and online forums associated with NAGT. Please read the full NAGT code of conduct policy linked in the chat for details. Today's webinar is titled Inclusion Through STEM Experiences, Approaches to Increase Access and Accommodations, presented by Wendy J.W. Williams from South Texas College and Sean Thatcher, Chairman of the IAGD Student Committee and from Rutgers University. They are going to discuss strategies for designing or modifying pedagogical ways of doing to reinforce increasing the diversity of students benefiting from various learned learning space experiences. Thank you both so much for participating in the NAGT webinar series. You guys go ahead and take it away. Well, hi, great everybody. Um, Sean and I are here as long as our bandwidth permits. And with your permission, I'll probably mute my video also so that the audio will go. Ms. Bradley is going to be um, handling it from our side. So you'll hear us say slide, slide. That way we can make sure that the internet connection stays stable for everybody. So today, um, if you will do slide. There were three main things that we would like to touch upon with you. And I say touch upon because there's a lot that goes into this. And this might be an opportunity for us to um, have a dialogue extend past today's webinar. But first, Sean and I would like to share with you some common barriers to access and inclusion in STEM with regard to persons with disabilities and other students. Introducing uh, this concept of universal design for learning to help us try to bridge any type of accommodations. And then we're gonna explore about a handful of embedded things that we can do for those students in our environments that have physical or non-apparent um, invisible disabilities. And then time permitting, we have a little bit about some resources outside of the geosciences on things that others are doing that may be very well something we should be incorporating in how we do things with our own students. Slide. Hey everyone, uh, so just a brief introduction of myself. My name is Sean Thatcher. I'm a, I'm a GIS analyst and a geoscience educator. I focus mostly on remote sensing technologies and how they can be used to analyze coastal communities, especially regarding to climate resiliency. I'm also going to be an adjunct come this fall semester with the City University of New York at the College of Staten Island and at Rutgers University. I'm also the chairman of the IAGV uh, student community where we help provide opportunities to students uh, with uh, and without disabilities and other aspects of marginalized groups to really break down those barriers of equal access. That way we can all participate in the geosciences equitably and equally and fairly. I am also an IAGD co-liaison for the AGI Inter-Society Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Community to help address some of these challenges. I am also a quadriplegic. I suffered a spinal cord injury in 2009 and I'm a wheelchair user, um, but that's never really stopped me from doing as many things as I physically can, like taking the obligatory photo at the Grand Canyon. Next slide, please. And I'm Wendy. So my students know me as Dr. Wendy because our department at the um, South Texas College Community College uses our formal titles, but uh, you know, I'm W cubed to me or mom to others. So what I've been doing for the last 25 years has been a blend of academia in community colleges and in four-year college university settings. I've worked for nonprofits as an education director 
uh, Fields Nature Center. I love doing pre-service and in-service teacher facilitation. And um, earlier in my career, I actually was working for private geotechnical engineering firms and environmental firms, and then working at county level government in Southern California. So I have a background in the workforce applications of being a geoscientist. And along with um, Sean, uh, we are newly co-liaisons to a new committee called the AGI Inter-Society Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, and we look forward to being able to contribute to broadening access and participation across all those member, member organizations. Slide. So uh, one, it's one of the societies that we mentioned was the International Association for Geoscience Diversity. So the IEGD, as it's more commonly known, is, known, is a 501c3 organization promoting equal access in the geosciences for all persons. Uh, we provide resources on a variety of different disabilities in classrooms to provide equal opportunities for students with physical and non-apparent disabilities to participate equitably and equally in classrooms. That way, um, they can achieve their academic and career goals in ways that students without disabilities usually don't have challenges doing. We also recently have uh, opportunities for students that are coming on board. So uh, feel free to check that out if you have students um, that are really interested in becoming more engaged with our community. Uh, we have a really short uh, video that we would like to show you of just some faces of members that are in the IHD community and some of the really scenic areas that we've gone and done accessible field trips. Um, for projects. It's about 23 seconds long and non-narrated. Bradley, if you could just hit play on that for us. So uh, we've done a bunch of really great field opportunities uh, that are accessible field trips for all uh, in places such as um, Mount St. Helens, the Petrified Forest, uh, and a bunch of other locations too. So if you have any interest in reaching out to us about those kinds of activities and opportunities, we'd love to talk about them at length. Next slide, please. Okay, so I think what we'd like to do now is first touch upon some common barriers to our students, to faculty, to staff, um, regarding access and inclusion in those same fields. Next. So there's different ways of doing, using that as an educator term, you know, and using these different ways is important to try to diminish or get rid of, you know, ideal world, barriers to learning and to support the success of our students in technical career fields. But what we'd like to do for a moment and ask you to ponder and think of two of the different types of diversity that comes to mind, whether it's in yourself, colleagues, your workplace, your students that you might be working with informally or formally, and drop them into the chat box for us. Yeah, these are great, you know, visual and auditory learners, neurodiversity, physical differences, age, you know, these personal experiences, you know, the lived experiences of how how you navigate the world. All of these are really great to talk about today. And race, absolutely, Karen, I agree with that as well. We have a lot of insight within this group. I'm, I'm glad to to observe that. Okay, next slide, please. Well, there looks like there's a lot of familiar things um, in the chat box to what's on this slide. So I, I think that our audience is on, on point with these things, such as even learning preferences, degree of college readiness. I do work for a community college. I work with dual credit students as well as traditionally aged and capable students. And so there's a broad diversity that way. Okay, next slide, please. So this really touches upon a lot of what we're talking about in regards to this chat that you guys 
Sean, um, your audio is cutting out. I'm going to really greatly point it out. And We seem to be having a technical difficulty. Sean, let me grab this slide just temporarily. So um, if you think about the things you dropped in the chat and that were some subcategories that were on the previous slide, and then we try to think about how we can group some of these challenging things, these potential barriers to students and faculty and staff, we are presenting uh, four categories for this one. You can have physical, barriers um, that ends up in unequal access. For instance, in your physical learning space, or if you're taking students or yourselves on trips, there's only stairs, perhaps there's no ramps or even lifts from street level up to um, the stairs entering a building in a city terrain, a city area or rugged terrain or lack of a vehicle to travel in that's accessible for wheelchairs. And Sean, at any point you think your audio is working, by means um, interrupt come on back in there's All also right, sensor okay go ahead and take the next one please uh yeah um so there are also sensory barriers that promote unequal access you know so uh media lack lack these are all barriers for individuals that are experiencing the world in different ways to be able to participate equally. And they very much so need to be included in the ways that we experience learning and the ways that we provide educational materials to those within our communities and with issues. Um, so these can be some really technical issues such as technical literacy, challenges to language and STEM, expose, um, limited exposure to technical training and educational opportunities due to the perpetual creation of privilege inaccessible lives that, you know, those socioeconomic barriers that are very much so a problem to the ways that, you know, we can bring these materials to anyone in equitable and fair ways. There are also social barriers. So the ways that we, the ways that experiential learning and network to allow students, faculty, and other professionals to participate in, you know, normal day-to-day -day life, you know, not everywhere has functioning elevators, ramps, let alone um, gender neutral bath bathrooms that allow people to participate in ways that reflect their own identity and the ways that they navigate the world. Next slide, please. So um, we have these barriers and there are different ways to address them. So there's the equality way that implies that each individual should have four different persons of different ability levels. Uh, so someone sitting in a wheelchair, a very tall man on a bike, an uh, average sized person on a bike, and a very short sized person on a bike. And not everyone can use the same bike, right? But if we provide an equitable accommodation that this can be addressed, everyone can participate in the same way, doing the same activity in ways that fits the way that they navigate and interact with the world. And that's exactly what we are trying to present here as ways that you know we can all participate within the Okay, Sean, your audio seems to have fallen off. If you'll allow me to just recommend to our participants that in this slide, we've defined the terms equality and equity. And then also notice that it's visually represented that under equality, sure, everybody seems to have some kind of mobility device, but doesn't match with their needs. Um, see the small child with the short end seam on the really tall bike with the bar. And that probably was me, my preference when I was a kid. Uh, versus how equity would distribute the tools to the appropriate needs uh, physically in other, other needs. Next. So we recognize that there are ample barriers um, to equity and equality and access, not only in STEM, but just in general. However, in terms of 
a learning space that might, we might be involved with K through um, college. Are there ways that we can try to design in and diminish barriers upfront proactively, maybe initially retroactively in the things that we already do, but now to move forward by doing by design deliberately? Next. So one of the ways to do that would be to apply this idea, these uh, set of guidelines for universal design and learning and instruction. Um, Bradley, would you go ahead and launch this for us? I'm from Sanger, California. I'm from UDL to change the world. I'm from Cardiff, Wales. I'm from Kentucky, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. I'm from England. I live and work in Netherlands. Vengo de Chile. And I use universal design for learning to show teachers that it actually is possible to address the needs of all of your students in your classroom at the same time. I use universal design for learning to remove barriers and provide equitable, meaningful access to all students. I'm from Malala, Oregon. Kingston, Ontario. Williamsburg, Virginia. And I'm using UDL to be a more reflective practitioner for, for throwing barriers to my students to make spaces for language learners so that all students have access to high levels of learning UDL is for everybody for all students across the world thank you next so the universal design guidelines have been out there now for several decades in various different forms and it actually originated outside of STEM education, but rather in infrastructure and architectural um, features to make access more available to people. But when we think about universal design guidelines in terms of educational practice, they are really truly best practices for the kinds of things that we would be discussing to make learner centered instruction and activity. And so, for example, as listed here under the bullets, there's different ways of doing um, if we're in person in a hybrid situation and also variations on a theme in a completely online situation as the case arises, that you have visual and auditory media, tactile media, that there are appropriate interpersonal strategies, learning space management ideas to use with your learners and whatever group of learners you have in that particular time frame. Um, for some of our learners, having routines and predictable structure and patterns of the way we do things, that predictability provides comfort and it reduces barriers to the cognitive load of learning and that we can do blended instructional techniques. But a big thing to remember is that one person's appropriate, like accommodation, maybe another person's barrier. So that keeps us working hard. Next. There are a couple groups that are very active in the United States on promoting and advocating for universal design and instruction and variations referred to as inclusive instruction. And one of them is Dr. Burke Stoller, who is affiliated with the University of Washington. And we'll see their link in just a moment. But I pulled a quote from online, but there's also um, expansion upon this in some of the books that she has published and that are available. And it's not just about education, actually, in the sense that it's direct with the students. Universal design of education and of learning really should go for all of the stakeholders involved and that there is more inclusion, not only for the students, but the staff, instructors, administrators, administrators, I know I repeated that, and visitors um, that come to us with a variety of diversity and um, we want to incorporate that into our classrooms. Next. So you're talking to a geosciences educator and um, I have found these particular items that are displayed on the, the slide and I'll auditorize in just a moment especially useful. Now, I did early on in my career, back in the early 2000s, um, have an opportunity to do some training through CAST um, on behalf of the university that I was employed with. 
my school, University of Arkansas Little Rock, had received a large federal grant from U.S. Department of Education, and the grant to our Office of Disabilities was to train various faculty and departments across the campus in universal design. This was in the early 2000s, and some of what we did was part of um, CAST. So universal design of learning guidelines are very in-depth, and if I could please have a drop in the chat of Good, great, thank you so much. That's what the little droplet is. It's a visual reminder that we needed to put something in the chat box for you. But um, Bradley, would you go ahead and click Universal Design for Learning Guidelines? I'll try to minimize launching outside too much. So when you go to their website directly, there is just lots and lots of information. If you wouldn't mind please clicking near the top of the page, the thing that looks like a little um, table in colors. Yes, thank you. Great. So when you start delving into practices and techniques in UDL, you'll see that there are things that are with refer, referred to the effective, um, the re recognition and the strategic networks, the different domains. And at each of those places in their guide, you can click to get more information on strategies to do with face-to-face, -face, hybrid, or online formats. Um, some of them cross cut the modality of that you might actually be working with, say, um, students in that case. I don't think everybody in our um, webinar today is participants are directly working with students, but in support of and through products. So I wanted to bring this to your attention um, to encourage you to look at more in depth at the resources that are there for some strategies. There are low stake strategies. There are those things that are higher stakes um, in terms of helping raise scores, if that's what your administration is interested in, and also different ways to um, collaborate with other educators on these, these activities. So if we could back out of this screen, please. Great. And then the second drop that was in your chat box, if we can click on that, please, do it disabilities, opportunities. This is to show you that we've launched their website. And this is one that um, Cheryl Bergstaller and others have been working on now for quite a while. And there are just many different places to go to, but it is at this website here, broken out to guide you if you're an educator directly or if you're a student looking for opportunities. And then some of the other diverse categories that we had talked about earlier in this presentation, for example, for veterans. Um, there's a lot of intersectionality between the different populations that we work with. And for many of those populations, it also includes persons with and without disabilities. And so um, I thought perhaps you would appreciate these resources. These are the ones that are more specific to STEM. And although we're not going to launch their STEM access site, I encourage you when you're offline and later after this webinar, not immediately, but soon after, these resources will be available, available for you and archived at the uh, professional webinar location for this, this talk. If you can back out, please. Okay, so let's go ahead and proceed. So once you get the idea of the guidelines for universal design, make it multimodal, make sure that you build into it what many of us have had to do very rapidly moving online perhaps in the last year uh, or not. Maybe you were already doing these best practices already. Um, that there's ways to embed different things either in the digital technology or in the way that you manage and have your learner-centered activities work in person that actually benefit many of our different learners, whether it's learning preferences or it is for persons with varying disabilities that are present in our class in any given semester. Next. So one of the uh, resources that I'd like to share, and I noticed that there are people in our participants live here with us today that have benefited directly from these by being in workshops with each other. And I'm gonna give a shout out to y'all because hey, nice to meet, see you again, and nice to meet everybody else. But if you haven't heard about it, there is a community of practice that is through the SAGE 2YC. And although the 2YC represents community colleges, actually, I would say almost everything that is at these websites are appropriate for the first two years of an undergraduate circumstance. Um, these are things that support students holistically. 
And for example, on the left, it talks about different professional pathways with respect to geosciences, how to support academic success in these freshman and sophomore level college students. And then that lower role, row, and this is a screen capture, so there's actually more on the website below this, but the by broadening participation, one of the call out fields after self-regulation and stereotype threat is um, working with students with disabilities. So the screenshot that is a partial screenshot on the right hand side is popping out that supporting students with disabilities. And so if you are um, just stepping into thinking about working specifically with persons with disabilities at a deeper level, then this is a good tutorial website that takes you into um, how they might be in your classes. What At the time that this website was posted, which was around 2013, if I'm recalling correctly, the legal and professional obligations um, minimums, but you can always strive to go beyond that. What are some common challenges and success strategies? And there are um, testimonials and examples from faculty around the country, predominantly at community colleges that are incorporated into these um, web resources. And so um, Bradley has dropped this web address right into um, the chat box for you if you wanted to grab it so that you can have it sooner than when we get our presentation and ancillaries out to you. If you'll go to the next slide, please. Okay, Sean. So UDLs can sound really intimidating, right? There's a lot to do and a lot that you need to take care of, but the best way to do this is to be proactive and not reactive when designing ways of doing. So this means using the appropriate headers, numbering, and bullets so they're easier to navigate. Uh, it means create and utilize multimedia content to engage users in multiple different ways, um, to have them participate in ways that they are most comfortable with. Remembering to add in, close, and open captioning to all narration for those uh, that might be working in different um, programs. Adding alt text to all visual content. Um, and keeping accessibility in mind when creating field trips as well. So for so many of us in STEM, uh, there are field trips that are constantly there, and not just in geosciences, field I can imagine. So this means that, you know, finding out, hey, are there accessible bathrooms? And not just accessible bathrooms, but are there gender neutral bathrooms that are also reflective of the students' identities? Are there curb cuts at the locations that you're going to? Are there ramps so people can access the building. Not only centered on wheelchairs, but sometimes people with mobility issues have very difficult times walking far distances. What's the weather going to be like? You know, you don't really know how uh, well people are familiar with the climate in an area, especially if they're going on a trip. So, you know, being familiar with, you know, what that's really important. Activity descriptions and evaluations. Knowing how your students uh, are going to be critiqued and graded, um, gives you a really clear idea on how to present material, but it also reduces the anxiety that they feel when they don't know what they're being, analogy doesn't always work when you want it to, like my bandwidth. Um, so proactivity will save you valuable time and it will become habitual in the future. The more you practice it and the more proactive you are, the more you don't need to think about it going forward because you're implementing materials used in them, and then interacting with students going forward. Next slide, please. Um, actually, I'd like to make a comment. Don't have to go back in the slide, but there was one comment about weather. You know, when we have, for instance, intro students that may or may not be majors with us, they might not realize that if you're a geoscientist, often you go out in pretty much all kind of weather. And so that can be very... Um, disconcerting to somebody, but a personal note from when I was teaching with Northwest Arkansas Community College, which is in the Ozarks, so we are in a, a karst terrain, I had a young man that he and his family are depicted in the photograph that we used for advertising this inclusion website, maybe you've, or a web webinar, perhaps you saw this when you're at the NAGT site to register, and it's a view um, through a tunnel, and it's from the back, and there's lighting at the end of the tunnel, 
coming through the tunnel and it's lighting up not only this young man in his wheelchair, but a family member is assisting him with his mobility of that chair in this uneven but not totally inaccessible um, tunnel terrain. And then also his young nephew was skipping along the side as we were going to our next inclusive geology field stop. But I mentioned it because it was the weather at the ground level and above that was problematic for him. It was a summer class. The temperature was going to get over 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And because of his um, physical disability and inability to sweat, this was going to be a barrier for him to be part of our trip. And so knowing that in advance, I was able to work with a local commercial caving group, and they gave us special permission to do the second half of our trip underground. And where it was a nice, warm 55 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm saying that sarcastically, I'm still a little chilly at the thought of it, um, but it was perfect for him. And we were able to not only extend what the geology content was that we could cover, but we were able to make everybody comfortable in the learning environment. So thank you for letting me add to that slide, Sean. Here is a slide that says another way um, you can embed different kinds of accessibility is to think in terms like many of us are online right now. So an organization called Respectability has a guide for you that is hyperlinked that will take you on how to ensure virtual events are accessible to all. Part of it, of course, is making sure that you have the other things that we've talked about that all of us have been um, experiencing over the last several months in our online environment about alt tags and sound and transcripts, but also in terms of lengths of meetings, realizing that bandwidth may not be behaving itself. Um, so I encourage you to go to that link when you have our document. The other thing is when we are um, mostly back together, and maybe some of you are already, Think about the setting that your learning space is. And if you don't have fixed furniture, or if you can um, try to petition not to have fixed furniture in the room, that there are certain more optimized ways to set up a classroom, say, to facilitate a person who is deaf of hard of hearing to have line of sight view of the faculty member or the faces and reactions of other students in the room. And by positioning perhaps in a U shape, the chairs and the projection is going to the screen and it's not blocked by other furniture or the faculty member themselves, that you can maximize the opportunity for the student to either hear with hearing aids or a C loop built into the classroom, but also to be able to lip read if necessary. Um, one thing that's not on here is if you have a darkened room during your activity, you should have some type of lighting so that your lips are visible to the student that might be lip reading. So um, that is an example of thinking about how physical learning spaces can be configured under your control. Next. Another thing that you can embed into your learning environment is that you may find that any given semester or term that you have a student that is deaf or hard of hearing that part of their accommodation um, and access is through having an interpreter. Um, if we're, if you're in the United States, that would be the American Sign Language interpreters. And I wanted to draw your attention that there are some newer types of um, things available to us online. For instance, through the Rochester Institute of Technology, there is a science signs lexicon site that is being developed and they're adding to it. And so if for a second, let's see, you went ahead and dropped the drop. Thank you so much. Um, it is not fully comprehensive for all of the science content, but you can go to that website. You can search by the alphabet letter for the word, the term that you want to use, and there will be an um, image of an American Sign Language doing that term rather than spelling it out with finger spelling, for instance. And the image that is to the bottom that um, when these archived materials are available, the hyperlinks are available to it there. Also affiliated with RIT through the is a project that's called ASL Core, and it celebrates both American Sign Language and also deaf culture. And it has uh, resources there regarding deaf culture. And the screen capture that I provided in the lower right hand side just shows some of the areas that they do have sign language, whether it is an established sign for a particular scientific object or concept and or how to finger spell it. So if you are um, familiar with ASL, which I am just a little bit, um, 
but I'm learning, then take a look at that. This may be useful, if not directly for you or this semester or starting in the summer or fall, but perhaps having that conversation with any type of student support services members that you have the interpreter pool uh, in advance of need to see how that can be used. And then um, there was a new article link at the bottom. I was just looking over at the chat box and if you don't mind, um, Ashley, we'll have a time a little later on and I'd like to come back to what you're asking, okay? Because it does relate to um, deaf culture and access. Okay, next slide, please. All right, well, um, there are a number of students in our population, number of staffers and faculty members or people who are working elsewhere in STEM fields that actually have color vision deficiency also known as color blindness earlier. And so we wanted to give you one of at least five or six resources or, that are out there where you can evaluate imagery that you want to use with your own students or yourself for are they going to convey the information you want if your image only conveys information through color. That in itself is not a best universal design practice. If you're going to be conveying information graphically or in images, for instance, you can use color, but you can also then um, layer that in with different line weights, different line types, the addition of symbols, other ways to convey important information if it's not specifically an XY plot that shows numerics and dots, that to try to avoid from this point forward, having plotted lines only as a red solid line, a green solid line, a blue solid line, because there will be people that you want to use your information that will not be able to access it because of the choice of colors. And so, um, for example, I wanted to share with you colorblindness.com. And one of the things that they have available for free through it is their Cobliss Color Blindness Simulator. And I did a screen capture on the lower left-hand side. There's the web link above it. And I actually added a Creative Commons electromagnetic scale image that I pulled off the web and I dropped it in there. And then if you will look, um, I, I'm not the one sharing the screen, so you can't see my cursor. So I'm gonna to try to guide you in words. Just above that full electromagnetic scale image, there is a box that says drag and drop or paste your file in the area below, choose file. And that's how I did, okay? And then below that, it recognizes several major categories of color vision deficiency, trichromatic, dichromatic, and monochromatic. And then other choices you have to set is, for instance, they use the term normal or trichromatic view, and that's what it's defaulted to there. But then under anomalous trichromacy, there's three categories where there's a red weakness, there's a green weakness or a blue weakness. Um, there's di dichromatic view. Thank you very much, Vanna, for doing that. I appreciate it. <laughs> Just a, a shout out to, uh, what is that, where they turn the letters? Thank you for doing the arrows. Under dichromatic view, there's a red blindness, protonopia, there's a green blindness, deuteronopia, and blue blindness, trinopia. And then to the far right is versions of monochromatic view. And then in this simulator, you can choose lenses, meaning a clear glass lens, no lens on your eye. Um, if you were to choose the normal lens, um, it's almost as if there's no lens and no correction. And then the inverse lens, and you get this information from their website, is a corrective lens. Um, not 100% corrective for these different degrees of color vision deficiency, but it is notable. So I ran this through, and on the right-hand side, I compiled a series of little screen captures of just the visible spectrum. And if you are able to see the full trichromatic view, then this, will, this presentation will benefit you the most. But I stacked under the anomalous trichromacy, the red week on top, the green week in the middle, and the blue week. Remember, we're starting with Roy G. Biv, as we did in that image that we put into the um, simulator. Perhaps you can observe how those colors shifted. And then likewise, I did the same thing for dichromatic for the same image. And then I did little screen captures of each of them for the red blind, the green blind, and the blue blind, and the monochromatic similarly. 
If you are able, then you will see that there are changes, some dramatic changes. Next slide, please. So let's ponder. Is this kind of a familiar graphic maybe if you've ever taught an intro geology and you were working on igneous rocks and there were um, picture galleries of the various different composition of igneous rocks such as we see here on the left. This is what we work with. I work with this with my own students and it is colorized. And so what I did is I took that graphic and I ran it through the simulator. I didn't do all permutations from the simulator, but what I captured and shared with you on the right hand side in the upper part, for instance, was under the trichromacy that was the red um, weak version under and the next pair below that was under the I don't have the the previous slide in front of me, my brain is forgetting the other middle version, the dichromacy. And then um, that was also the red, red blind version. And then um, over a monochromatic, I did just the plain straight monochromatic so that you can see that if you have a person with color vision deficiency, maybe they may or may not know that they have it um, until something is a key indicator to them that they do. Can you see that how we might describe and work with students online, in person, in labs, where we use colors in describing not as the key physical properties for identification of minerals and minerals make up rocks, but how if we use color, it can be a barrier to some of our students, whether they advocate for themselves or not, whether they're aware of it or not. So what strategies can you use to teach materials in a more universal design way? when you have this type of um, awareness of CVD, color vision deficiency. You're welcome to drop that one in the chat. I know I didn't give a visual cue for that, but if you want to ponder that, we'd welcome it. And by the way, the transcript from the chat will be part of what's archived and released at the NAGT website afterwards. Next slide, please. Um, very quickly, I would like to share with you that there are a lot of folks that are either adopting um, materials out there that are softwares or applications for cell phones, smartphones, all the way through computers, or they might be in the situation where they are doing science education research and they're trying to develop similar tools of software and app delivery for education technology. Um, if you or your students are not aware or another contractor that you might be bringing onto your project about the World Wide Web Consortium, these are hyperlinked aspects that are in this file available to you to take a, a deeper dive into how do you make a web um, delivered through the internet using internet browsers more accessible. There's a series of tutorials to do that. Or also, if you want to um, start creating apps for mobile devices, the kinds of things to think about, whether this is something you're just doing locally for your own class, or you might be looking to acquire grant support to do this at a bigger pilot scale. Thank you, next slide. One of the things that's making universal design in online modes through course management systems or learning management systems, um, making UDL a little easier to do these days, didn't have this 10 years ago or earlier than that, um, is that this recognition of really, we need to be doing ADA compliance in our softwares. And so for the example, where I teach currently, we use the Blackboard, um, course management system, and they have a third party integrated aspect in the version that my school has adopted called Ally, A-L-L-Y. And so what I'm trying to depict on this slide is on the left hand side, there's a small screen capture from within my Blackboard module for my students on mineral content. And one of the things I provide them is a file presentation and study tool. But just to the left of that is an icon with a capital A and a downward pointing arrow. And when you click on that, you get a menu pop up. And that's what I did a screen capture on the right side to share with you. And this ally will allow students to then select if they need an alternative format 
It may or may not because of a disability needing access, but it may be because of a preference to be able to not be on a full computer, but rather bring the content to study down onto their smartphone, their mobile device, for instance. And so I know that there are other um, platforms, Canvas, Moodle, and others. I don't have current access to them to give you that visual example and to talk you through it. But I encourage you to take a look in the products that you might be using to see how accessible they are. OK, next slide. OK, Sean. So uh, there are a lot of synchronous and asynchronous learning opportunities um, that we've all been engaging with with the onset of the pandemic. And new strategies have been implemented using UDL to promote learning and virtual experiences. So um, creating a remote learning experience should really use a combination of synchronous and asynchronous learning strategies. So for synchronous, provide, it really provides the social interaction to encourage peer learning peers at the undergraduate level and at the graduate level those networking opportunities are essential to having an enriching educational experience the asynchronous opportunity uh, opportunities with remote teaching allow students to learn the ways that promotes independence and information and this allows students to really engage with materials in unique and novel ways allowing them to be able to rewind recorded lectures to really get the most out of them, uh, to really enhance the way that they engage with this content. To um, remote learning has leveled the playing field in a lot of unique ways. Um, everyone can no longer access the physical locations that they used to work, on, work at. So, you know, field trips, field camps, and lab work have all been remote, which has caused everyone from the same learning experiences that they are more accustomed to. Next slide, please. So this is from a Geopath project that was funded between 2015 to 2017 that brought a, in field learning that really incorporated remote um, communication technologies to encourage collaboration. Um, if we can just hit play on this video for a brief moment, it's about three minutes long with closed captioning. I think it would be really enriching to see how, you know, with a little bit of planning, we can get a post-pandemic world or a hybrid model uh, going forward. Remote collaboration uses teamwork and technology to enable students in different locations to collaborate on learning activities in the field. Today we're using a local wireless network to connect up students that are spread across this site. So on the local network we've got video streaming between the iPads, we've got photographs that can be shared, and we're using walkie-talkies to keep people in audio. Two approaches to remote collaboration were used during the course of the project. At the first field site, student teams worked at different locations and collected data to build a collaborative structural map of the area. The area that we chose along the old railway track was an ideal location. Here we were able to use the railroad, the old rock canyons that were cut out for all of the students, mobile and less mobile, to come along and put their hands on the outcrop, able to use technology that I've just seen for the first time in the field, really, at such a, a, a general level, dealing with the iPads, measuring dip and strike, taking photographs, communicating between each other's groups by the lakeshore, groups on the road, all working in unison. Very, very good indeed. While the road provided access to some outcrops, the combination of rock and bog made the rest of the field site far less accessible. This is where mixed ability groupings really shine. If the sheep can do it, so can I. That's what I'm thinking. Through the use of wearable cameras and tablets, these students share their experiences with a first-person vantage point of fieldwork in this challenging terrain. The rain's like ice daggers. Another location pushed the idea of access through technology even further. With no accessible route to the field site and windy conditions, the base team would have to stay inside the vans for communication to work effectively. 
and their only means to conduct field work would be through the remote link with their teammates. at the bottom, followed by thinning and silty material in the middle, and then back makes, to larger. Are you seeing that? That makes sense, too, because as the glacier retreated, there was all the fluvial activity from, like, the outwash plant. Is there anything you want? Through the use of streaming video and photo sharing, teams were able to work together in real time to study the geology of a location that would have traditionally excluded participation for students with mobility limitations. Great. So if you could just throw in the chat most intriguing possible for setting and uh, for, um, and briefly setting of why of, you know, so what are ways that you can incorporate these kinds of things into um, ways to really dismantle these barriers? Uh, um, in your own educational endeavors. Yeah. Even in my own experience, uh, Jackie, mixability groupings are a phenomenal way that have really helped me overcome a lot of physical barriers personally. And a lot of others that have very similar challenges like me as well. Uh, next slide, please. So there is a slippery slope with the virtual experiences as becoming the new museum option. Um, So as the world reopens and the virtual become, you know, no longer the desired mechanism, they should not be the default accessible option for students. So these options very much so promote feelings of otherness. It encourages the perpetuation of ableist and racial stereotypes that these that are available to these students, along with the employment opportunities specifically concerning if they are missing activities like field camps. And it, and causes them to actually just leave STEM fields in general. Um, and in short, just ableism really quickly is the discrimination based on the belief that typical abilities are superior and more desired than those with physical limitations. So in, I just want you to briefly think of the past year and consider how things could have been better if we were all together. And that's exactly what that virtual or museum option only will be. You can just do this instead, alone, by yourself. You know, everyone, mental health right now is a really big topic as it should be. And this is one of those that we really need to take a good, hard look at to see that this is not going to be the uh, provided option for our students with disabilities or physical limitations, but you know, really provide, if, provide a way that if it's not the option for all students, then it shouldn't just be the only option for students with limitations as well. Next slide, please. So this is Wendy and we are getting a little short for time, but what I wanted to share with you is absolutely having closed caption or running it open caption on streaming videos with audio and narration, and even if it's just music, still have captioning that shows musical symbols and maybe describes briefly what kind of music, jaunty, jazzy, um, looming and, and dooming, hopefully not, maybe with a volcanic eruption. But one of the better practices is adding scene narration or audio description, which is another layer of audio that is quietly trying not to overlap on the regular narration, but trying to describe briefly what's in the scene so that persons without vision can actually know, is this a group of people doing sign language, like the little embedded image there? If we could please, Bradley, just run it for about a minute and everybody listen, because there's different levels of audio going on. Writing's not that easy, but Grammarly can help. This sentence is grammatically correct. Rectangles move across the screen. Various scenes slide past, including a student at a computer, a young woman building a paper airplane, a dark-haired student tosses his paper airplane and it lands on a desk. Someone reads a braille document and a man signs. The screen reads, Equal Access, Universal Design of Instruction, with our host. Hi, 
I'm Cheryl Bergstaller. So I used to be a math. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and back out of that. And also notice in this YouTube link, we could have enabled the closed captioning so it was streaming at the base as well. So you may have somebody that is um, vision impaired, they can't see the captioning, so you need to have the audio playing, but then there's also this scene narration um, description going on to just give a sense in the mind's eye what's going on. This is much more common these days in a lot of these streaming networks like um, Netflix, for example, and Amazon. Okay, next channel, uh, next slide, excuse me. Sean. So GIS is the use of the geographic information systems, and they are phenomenal ways to provide access for opportunities that are not no longer available to students that can allow users with limitations to pursue research interests near and far, provides a sense of ownership of the project they are working on, provide a place to the intellectual strengths of those individuals, builds desirable technical skills that are highly desired in the workplace going within our fields. Limitations to this are that it's visual in nature, there's a cost and technical expertise that is required and the lack of access. Not every university has access to some of these commercial technologies. But we're just going to touch upon the next slide, please. So everyone is very familiar with, there's a, low, a lot of low tech options and high tech options concerning GIS. So Google Earth is one of the Those, um, that everyone is very familiar, general audience and general public at large can use them very quickly. Um, the desktop version of Google Earth Pro can allow for image interpretation, basic digitization and mapping along with annotations and story maps can be easily created along with exploratory field trips using Google Tours. However, there are available that allow for geospatial analysis such as Google Earth Engine and QGIS that are open source, along with the commercial options such as ArcGIS. Um, these allow, these have a moderate understanding of mathematics and programming, advanced image analysis, editing interpretations, scientists. Um, although, although there is the coding aspect in some of these, um, I firmly believe that there are options for all that can be doing this. Google Earth Engine also is applicable with screen readers for those to navigate the screen and nav navigate those as we mentioned before you can really overcome those barriers and challenges to the visual interpretations if those become issues uh, next slide please so using a uh, gis with udl you have color vision deficiency um, and are working in mixability groups so Drought analysis is really common practice um, in GIS that's very introductory. Using Earth Engine specifically, we brought in NOAA's Persian models that, that um, measures a uh, number of days since that is hyperspectral imagery that incorporates wavelengths of light as bands that we cannot see with our normal eyes to conduct a normalized difference of vegetation index called an NDVI. Uh, it's, it's typically really frustrating for those with color vision deficiency to look at because we did this and uh, we went from a red to green color scale to show how quickly it can be implemented in a grayscale. And there are numerous options for resources in a variety of formats that are perfect for UDL, such as very effective documentation, tutorial videos that, that, that they need. So the next two slides just have the uh, red to green color scale for this type of analysis over California, right? And it's like, and it can even hurt your eyes even if you don't have color vision deficiency, it's just very glaring to another issue. But if you look at the next slide, we all we did was quickly change the color scale. And now it's on a red, now it's on a gray scale. All of this can be done free of charge using uh, Earth Engine servers. That way, there's no extra processing on your own. They're doing concerning uh, geospatial analysis. 
and and all of the JavaScript here can be done can be learned using Code Academy, and can be used also learned using open source opportunities through. Uh, Uh, Google Earth Engine specifically. Next slide, please. And Sean, we are down to the wire. Yes. So um, some resources outside of the geosciences to consider. These are all hyperlinked and will be part of um, a hyperlinked glossary that we'll provide. And by the way, for people that use screen readers, it's not best practices to have the full HTML web address shown because of the way it reads into that student's mind. And so there's suggestions to use it this way. Um, but I realize that there's also a use for having it spelled out. So I'll develop a glossary to also provide as ancillaries to this talk. You can see that there are things going on in astronomy, chemistry, the use of sound to evaluate and convey data, especially for somebody who is blind, is called sonification. So these are some resources that are available to you as well. Next, please. We'll go ahead and skip this slide, please. We have com com compiled some literature resources, not only for some of the things that we referenced today, but th some to extend um, resources for you to look into next. Next. And we both, if Sean wants to come off of mute, want to thank you so much for being with us today. Here is our email. Um, addresses. If you would like to contact us, just do a favor and please remind me and Sean how we met. And we met through an NAGT professional webinar. Thank you. Yes, thank you everyone so much. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for your presentation and for taking the time. Um, and thank everyone for coming to the presentation and spending our time with us. Um,